All right, here we are, episode four of the Enterprise Eyeballs podcast, all about getting eyeballs on your content in the B2B world and getting the mind share we all crave in an overly information-packed, inundated world. Today for this episode, our guest is Chris Bogue. He makes mercifully short video content on LinkedIn for prospecting with Vidyard or anything you need to get attention um, in our B2B world. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Andrew. So we've done zero preparation because you come from an improvisation background. And, you know, when we first connected, I loved hearing your story. I was hoping you could share with the audience just where you come from, what you've been doing and how all the pieces fit together. Because I don't know if I've met anyone quite like it. Oh, quite thank like you. you. Um, well, I was born and raised in Chicago, so I'm, I'm a Chicagoan through and through. And after I graduated from college, I did a lot of sketch comedy, a lot of improv comedy, a lot of stand-up comedy, and a lot of experimental theater. And I did comedy for about 15 years. I loved it. I you know played at Second City, and I wrote and directed shows there for ensembles. And um, that was always more important to me than business success. Just going up there on the stage, just really trying to do things, trying to get those laughs, learning the craft of comedy. But I did sales anyway, because you got to pay the bills, right? So I was doing a lot of tech sales. And then when COVID struck, I was doing sales with universities. So I was selling AI-based discussion software to PhDs at schools like Rutgers and USC. And COVID happened, and they didn't know what to do. My company didn't know what to do, because nobody had a plan for this. And the easiest way to sell to those people was uh, – there's three ways. So you could call them in their office, you could visit them on campus, or you could visit them at an educational conference. So the three best ways to reach them just dried up. And I'm like, I'm going to get on video. You know, I'm just going to put – I'm going to get on my phone and I'm going to just, just you know, be like in 30 seconds, just – Hey, Dr. Smith, I'm the guy that keeps calling you. Um, here's actually why I want to talk to you. I know you've, you've done a bunch of research on critical thinking and, um, that's, that's what we do. So, you know, here's my calendar. Let's talk. And, um, I suddenly realized that I could outperform the top salespeople on my team. And, you know, maybe, you know, one of my team members, we were using a program called Drift. They would make four videos in a month and I could make 25 in an afternoon. And I was like, this is incredibly powerful because um, everybody's just sitting at home in their living rooms, especially the, the you know, the sea level class. Um, they're jet setting, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're around wearing comfy pants. And I'm like, they're, they're sitting at home. The problem isn't that they don't have time. It's that they're not interested because they don't know who I am. But if I get on camera and be super interesting and I capture their attention, yeah, of course you can influence them and you can sell them. So uh, I quit my job. I'm writing a book. I just became a coach. You know, I, I quit. I'm just like, I'm going to start teaching people how to get on camera. And, you know, now I do a weekly show on LinkedIn Live. I'm putting content out there every day. I'm doing audio and video content. And I train individuals and sales teams for how to get on video. So either that's uh, direct marketing materials or direct sales materials to decision makers. So C-level people, um, or, you know, I help people make marketing content too. So everybody wants to get on TikTok. TikTok is a big variety show. It is an international variety show that happens 24 seven. And if you can get on camera and play and you can be fun and interesting, uh, that's what TikTok wants. So I use the improv training, um, use it to make sales less artificial, and then just figure out how do you capture someone's attention by having fun. I love that and uh, fits perfectly with the theme of the day. We were talking earlier with Caroline Van Buskirk about her LinkedIn uh, holiday countdown she did for, for NetApp where she really improvised and did some spontaneous content and uh, got tons of engagement with just having fun on camera. And so you guys are a perfect fit to, to have both recordings uh, on the same day. You know, there's so much that uh, you've mentioned that I want to unpack but I want to go all the way back to your intro. So I think most of us are familiar with sketch comedy. Most of our most most of us are familiar with improv. Um, but for those of us who don't know, what's a good example of uh, experimental theater you described? So um, there's two examples I can give you. One is: um, Are you a Ted Lasso fan, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed the first season. Okay, so um, Coach Beard. 
before he was Coach Beard, that's Brendan Hunt is the actor, but he had an experimental theater called Theater of Ted. And I, I did shows there when I was in college and it started at midnight and it ended whenever. You, it would just go on all night. Um, nobody was cut off. Anybody could walk on stage. Anybody could do anything. The only two rules were clean up after your act and don't hurt yourself or anybody in the audience. <laughs> Other than that, it was no holds barred. So there was comedy, there was, you know, dance, there was music, um, there were monologues, drunk idiots would go up there and tell 20 minute rambling stories. People would get naked and run around. It was just, there were no limits. And it, and it was all about just pushing the bar as far as you could. And, and, um, Brendan actually, when he first started, his very first act, when he started Theater of Ted was he stripped down completely naked and did jumping jacks because he wanted to show the audience, if I can do this, if I can go put myself out there with no shame, you can get up here and do anything. And um, that was really a turning point because I was already doing sketch comedy. I was already doing improv. But it was just one of those things where it was this midnight. It was Saturday at midnight was when it would happen. So you'd get your friends together and you're like, okay, you're a rapper. And we've got you, t you know, these three, they're in dance school. And he's going to go up there and do a poem. And it was we would just combine all these talents. And sometimes it would fall flat. But the rule was it was theater of Ted, enthusiastic applause. So no matter how bad it was, the audience had to applaud. And um, the philosophy there was dare to suck, which doesn't mean try to suck. It means do, do whatever you want to do. Really go out there on a limb and don't worry if it fails. You know, the, the important thing is that you did something cool. And, you know, I noticed I would, I would do these things. We'd come up with these weird experimental things that were a blend of sketch comedy, but also different forms of it. And I realized like, wow, every time we do something weird, the audience goes nuts. They love it, you know? <laughs> and then I started doing sketch comedy and I started writing shows and, you know, Second City has this very classic style where they still teach sketch comedy the way they did in the 1950s. You know, if you go there, you still get the same training that John Belushi got, you know, or um, Tina Fey or, or Stephen Colbert. There's like 12 different types of scene structures they teach you. Um, and it's a very classical approach to theater. So I learned this, this approach to character building and world building and scene building. But then I was also learning with this other group called the Neo Futurists. And this is like super niche, super obscure. You really got to get into like the black uh, box theater scene in Chicago to know this, but they're the opposite of second city. So um, they did a show, they had to change the name recently, but for like 30 years, the show was called too much light makes the baby go blind. And um, <laughs> the premise is it's 30 plays in 60 minutes. So they set a clock. There's a clothesline running across the top of the stage with the numbers one through 30 on index cards. And the audience just starts screaming numbers. As soon as one of the plays is done, Whatever number you hear, you jump up, you scream that, you read the title of the play, and then that's the one you perform. And you got to get all 30 done in 60 minutes. Um, otherwise, the show just ends early. It just ends before you get to the end. And it's a mix of every... You, the, only, the rules there are you are not allowed to play characters. If you went and learned from the neo-futurist, Andrew, you would have to do every single play as Andrew. And you can't... You can't lie. You can't make up stories. It, it all has to be the truth. But the idea is you're bringing the audience on an experience with you. And you'll notice in all my videos, even though it's straight to camera stuff, I'm talking to the audience like it's a character and I'm interacting with them and I'm giving them things to do and I'm giving them surprises. And it's because I'm trained in this version of hyper honesty. And that's actually very interesting for my sales training because I actually tell people you don't have to be on. Um, what I learned with the Neo Futurist is you as a person are just interesting. And if you are open, if you are open and neutral to your audience, they project themselves onto you and mm. um, you can surprise them. And um, once I learned that, it, it became powerful. Where I'm like, all these presentations, all these CEOs, all these corporate executive types, they are learning how to go put on a presentation voice. And if I just sit here in a t-shirt and I just talk to you like we're sitting in the living room together... I look more powerful than them, you know, and it's more interesting. And they're like, where's this guy taking me? What is this guy's deal? And um, people will look at me and they'll be like, I can't do what you're doing. You know, you have, a, and I'm just like, I'm sitting there looking at you. That's what's interesting. You know, I'm giving you what's really in me right now. You know, I'm here raw in the moment, but the fact that I'm looking at you, that's what's entertaining, you know, and um Performers are entertained by the audience. And if you're going after marketing, if you're going after C-level people, if you're going to people who are meetings all the time, yeah, you just sitting there being fixated on them, you know, that's so interesting. And um, yeah, it's actually just a lot, lot simpler what I'm doing than everybody else. 
<laughs> no, I like that. I think there's a lot to unpack there. And one of the things you said that, you know, goes back to our conversation when we connected was, uh, it, you know, you in the experimental theater, you broke all the rules. And in a conversation we had when we connected, when uh, you were learning about some of this video stuff that was really working, you were breaking all the rules. And so it's, a, it's an interesting connection where if you think about theater, where many of us would say there aren't any rules already, and then you're breaking out to this massive massively open world by breaking the rules that are there in theater. And then in the business world, we probably feel like there's a lot of rules and probably too many rules. And so you were just so trained to, to, uh, break through those. I think that's really you don't cool. Break them all. You don't break. That's the trick. So, um, I don't know if you know anything about board games or board game design. So I know a lot of board game designers and they, they taught me that the way you build a board game is you create a very, 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 very strict set of rules. And then one by one, you allow the players to break them. So it's like, okay, here's the die. You roll the die. Um, whatever the number is, you have to move that many spaces forward, right? So that's the rule you start with. And then you say, okay, um, except if you roll a four. If you roll a four, you can move four forwards or backwards. You know, now you've just given them license to break one thing. And I find even if you're not on video, even if you are just writing an, an email, right? Because you don't have to go be doing crazy sketch comedy the way I'm doing. I'm saying if you write an email, pull up, go go to LinkedIn, go to like the lavender guy, like, you know, um, who uh, will, um, he, he talks all about how to write a good email. Um, get the list of 12 things that every email is supposed to have. Break one of them. And break it astoundingly. Um, make it so weird and obvious that it's like, why would he ever do that? But the fact that you're following the 11 other conventions, they know you know what you're talking about, you know? And that's often what I'm doing in business is it's like, I am doing not, I'm checking all the boxes, but this one, I'm breaking the rules here and I'm going to stick out. And that's what human nature is all about. You know, we evolved because we, we know how to grasp. We can look at a bush and recognize, oh, there's the one berry sticking out. I'm going to go pluck that out. And that's, that's how we learn. We, we learn to look for the pattern and find the thing that's breaking the pattern. So I actually believe if you can adhere to the rules, just really obviously do one thing you're not supposed to do, that is how you get noticed. Really, really good advice. I love that. Um, yeah, it's like you have to stand out from the crowd, but you got to be in the crowd to begin with. Otherwise, you're playing the wrong game or something like that. And there's so many parallels between what you're describing and my experience in uh, my career as a designer. You know, when you approach brand design, it's very much that. How do we fit in to the crowd of our competitors and then stand wildly out, right? You can't look like a completely different uh industry or vertical, people will become confused, but you need to be different from the pack in order to differentiate yourself in a meaningful way. Uh, you know, and so it's a very interesting tension between following the rules and breaking them. And the same thing goes for user experience design and, and our experience at incentive pilot, you know, the, the games and the rewards and the experiences we create for reps and channel reps, uh, to get, to get eyeballs on the information and enablement that empowers them to do their jobs better. You know, it has to be interesting. It's got to be unexpected, like you're talking about, but it can't be a huge mental load. It can't take a bunch of their time. It can't be hard to do. So you have to violate their expectations in a good way to get their attention and then give them an experience that's really easy and fun, but also challenges them in a good way. And so finding that balance of sticking out, but blending in is really important. And it's kind of a, it's an interesting little key to, to, to human attention and experience. I think. I call it what I call what I do soliloquy training. If somebody signs up for a monthly package, that's called soliloquy because that's what Shakespeare did. You know, for those of us who don't remember, you know, freshman year of high school, English class, uh, a soliloquy is when the character breaks, ju they just talk straight to the audience. You know, usually there's this concept of the fourth wall, which is like the people on the TV can't see you. You know, we're just imagining that there's an invisible wall between us. But when they actually look at you and start talking to the audience, you know, that's very powerful. And Shakespeare did that. And so did The Office. You know, so did Parks and Rec. So did Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You get, once you start looking for it, there's all, Saved by the Bell, another popular one. Um, you know, it's this thing where it's like, once you look at the audience, 
And Bugs Bunny used to do it. You know, it's like you look at the audience and you can acknowledge the convention. And that's a lot of times what I do is you break through the awkwardness by acknowledging it. And you'd be like, hey, it's me. Um, I did send you seven emails, didn't I? I'm sorry about that. Um, but here's why. Um, I actually think I can help you. And I actually see what you're doing with an incentive pilot. And I, you know, you're, and then you start talking about them, you know, and even, um, you know, because again, I say, I say, go simple. You know, I had a client once and she's an SDR. She's trying to set meetings and, you know, she's on this like automatic touch point map where they're getting all these automated communications and stuff. And she really needs to get these big clients into meetings. So we made a GIF, you know, it's a three second GIF. And um, she's got a disco ball in a room because that's just like, so I'm like, turn the disco ball on. You're going to hold a piece of paper that says, sorry for all the emails. And you're going to look awkward. And you're going to go and you're just going to do a little disco dance, you know? And it's like you open it. The email is two sentences long. There's a human being. They're talking to you. They're emailing to you. But it's just this simple little thing where she's dancing and it's, it's a funny little gif. And it's, it's just the little things like that will show someone like, oh, this might actually be a cool person. Like actually, um, cause the thing you, salespeople don't think about, they take it so personally when they get rejected or when people are just like, and they hang up the phone on them. I'm like, until you introduce yourself, they don't know that you're not a scammer. Like they, they, you might be someone in another country just trying to steal their credit card. You know, they don't even know that you work for a legitimate company and that you're selling a service that's relevant to them, you know? So Breaking through that first step is the hardest part. But once you do that, it's just a matter of like, can I get in the room and talk to them? Yeah, starting the conversation. Um, it's huge. And we all have that guard up, right? I mean, who knows? I try to to uh, say thanks for reaching out. Good luck to everybody who contacts me because I know what it's like to be on the other side of that. And I know that a lot of them probably have great services. And the reality is that, Right now, I just don't have the time to entertain them, even if it could solve a huge problem for me. You know, uh, we all pack our days full of full of things to do and have a plan that we're executing. And so, I love that advice. Is you know, empathizing with the people reaching out to you and understand that they just don't have your perspective or see your perspective. And a lot of times, in the case of Incentive Pilot, you know, the folks we help the most are people who didn't even know they had a problem. You know, they were. Uh, <laughs> You know, not yeah. to make this an incentive pilot ad, but, you know, they were spending 40 hours a month managing incentive programs or promotions or uh, enablement programs. And then they start using the platform and like I did my, you know, I did my entire week in 10 minutes. What do I do now? It's like, oh, well, now you can go back to do the stuff that you were actually hired to do, which was strategically change these relationships and grow these accounts, you know. And so, yeah, it's like the, there's aware all these different varying awareness levels that you have to overcome. And all of that starts with that conversation. Well, and creative content can help that. And it's like, um, yeah, that is the problem. And that is why sales teams exist. Because 95% of people, they don't know the problem. And you have to make them aware of that. And actually, because like, I'm, I'm, you know, my own business here. So it's like, I have to get as much mileage as I can out of all my sales and marketing materials. So I know a lot, there's a lot of companies out there trying to do comedy. Um, you know, their stuff is funny, but it's not even necessarily related to business. Sometimes they're just asking questions or they're just, they're just reposting random memes. And all my stuff is about work because what I do is I think, okay, what if someone finds me on TikTok and I, potentially want them to hire me. Um, what I have to do is I have to show them solving a problem that they have, you know, and, um, I make it. So it's like, I say a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, you know? So, um, I'll make it funny. I'll throw jokes in there. I'll throw characters, I'll throw music. Um, I'll throw a bunch of surprises in there, but at the end I'm teaching you something. You know, and at the end, and, and, um, when I first started doing this, I felt kind of alone out here. I was kind of like, all right, I'm going to do, I'm going to embrace selling on video and, you know, improv based marketing content. Um, and now that TikTok's taken off and some time has passed on, people are kind of like, all right, maybe this guy's onto something. Um, but I had to go out there and show them. And oftentimes it's like, I know people don't like being lectured to and people don't like being promised a bunch of numbers about ROI. Um, but if you get them there and they're just having fun and all of a sudden they just realize that, oh, this guy actually knows about my world and um, he's saying the things I want to say and, and actually this guy seems like he understands where I'm coming from. 
you know, now you've earned the credibility. And, you know, I think the thing that we both discovered, Andrew, is um, you have to allow them to play. You have to give them some opportunity to play. Um, it can't just be about selling. It can't just be about value add. You know, TikTok, especially, people are getting out there to play. And the reason why I feel like I got my work cut out for me is because CEOs were not trained to play in public. You know, they were trained <laughs> to maintain their image. Um, maybe they're going to go play sports. Maybe they're going to go do something. Maybe they're going to play with their kids when the camera's off. But if you put a camera on a CEO and be like, do that funny bit, they they're, they turn ghostly white, <laughs> you know, because they never learned how to do that. And I'm like, yeah, it's okay. I, I paid a lot of money to learn how to, you know, do silly comedy. Um, but yeah, if I give them, you know, a minute where they're just playing with me and they accidentally learn something, um, yeah, that makes it a lot easier for me to sell to them. And for your case, if they're already invested in playing a game and they like it, um, yeah, it's much easier to strike up a conversation than to just call them cold and be like, hello, you are not expecting this call. Can I have 27 seconds? To it's like they recognize that cadence. They're so good at rejecting that, that they're not even considering that maybe you're offering them something valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the weird things is that, you know, we, the humanization is so important. All the things you do are humanizing you and people connect with that. And what is this lie we tell ourselves where, oh, the person, the other person on the other end of this phone or this Zoom call, they're serious. They're a professional. They're not going to like me to be a human being, you know? And it's like, we tell ourselves this lie and then we pretend and then they pretend back. And it just, it doesn't matter because we're all just craving a real human connection where yeah, we, more business is going to get done. We're acting the way we think they want us to act, but they don't. Actually, what people are, they're, they're sick of putting on a front. And, um, yeah, anytime I, I am, you know, ask someone like, how are you doing? They're like, living the dream. I'm like, uh, oh, <laughs> uh oh, that's not good. Um, which is why I ask more questions. I actually get people to tell me stories all the time. So I'm never like, how you doing? Um, you know, it's, how's your morning going? Um, if I'm trying to sell somebody, I'm never going to ask them what their company goals are because they've rehearsed that. You know, they've they've made the marketing materials. They have their elevator pitch down. Um, so I'll just be like, "Do you have any clients today?" And they're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "How'd that go?" You know. And when I was selling to professors, I was like, "How was class today?" And they'd be like, "Oh, it was all right." I'd be like, "Get any good questions?" And then they got to stop and think. They're like, "Huh." Did you I, know yeah. what? Yeah, one kid actually did ask me a question. And um, now I'm not asking them, now they're not giving me the prepared response, you know, which is that they're going to make X amount of revenue by the end of Q2. Um, now they're like, what did I have for breakfast? Oh, I skipped, bre you know what? My car wouldn't start, so I skipped breakfast. I should probably eat, you know? And now all of a sudden you're having this actual moment. And I find it so hard to do that. But again, I tell people that it's like you're overthinking personalization. And for me, it's like you don't even need the words. I tell people like if you are sending a video, you know, don't think about the 99. And I, I tell this to cold callers too. I'm like people who are, who are pounding the phones, they think about the 99 calls that they're going to have to make in order to get to call number 100 that sets a meeting. And I go, you need to flip that around. Assume that you make one call, it is going to pick up and that person is going to be there. Imagine that person was sitting across from you at your kitchen table and they've got a cup of coffee. What would you say to them then? You know, and I go, okay, so now that you know what to say, you're going to turn on the camera. It's morning time. You're going to, all you're going to do is you're going to tip your coffee mug to the camera and you say, good morning, you know, um, enjoying my coffee here. I'd actually really like to speak with you sometime you know, and, he and here's why. And just tipping the cup of coffee, that is, that is such a simple thing, but you learn in improv. It is, it is not that you do anything at all is more important than what you do. And if you're doing it with confidence, if you're doing it with intention, it can be very, very, very subtle. Um, but it works, you know, and, and yeah, these, these little subtle things take a moment. Half of what I do is I'm just making funny faces at the camera, <laughs> you know, and half of what I'm doing in my content is it's not even that the words are funny. It's I have engineered an awkward situation and I'm just sitting there looking deflated <laughs> at the camera because I feel so <laughs> awkward. And um, the audience is sitting there watching me going, you know what? I would feel pretty awkward too if I was in that situation. And the video is 10 seconds long. 
you know, and they liked it. And I, I got one point across to them, you know, and now it's like, I don't need to explain my life story. I can just reach out. And I'm like, yeah, I saw you like the video. I actually think I could help you do X and Y and Z. And if they're like, yeah, you just send the calendar invite. And you're like, great, let's talk about that. And um, I firmly believe, Andrew, that the problem with B2B right now is there are all these systems that people created that made a lot of sense when work started at 9 a.m. and ended at 5 p.m. And you had people and you had to get them out of there in a certain amount of times. And you couldn't do the meeting unless you could go meet in person, which means you had to restrict access to the conference room, which means you had to. And it's like now information is just out there. And um, you have to respect when someone's not ready. But if you get someone the moment they're ready to adopt that, you can fly through that transaction, you know, but not if you're creating ob like arbitrary obstacles and, you know, unnecessary meetings and unnecessary time. It's like you just get the person in there and if they're ready, they're ready, you know, and you can just move. And I think people are just afraid. They're, they're afraid to just ask and they're afraid to not have this process that removes every situa every step, several orders removed from them. And I'm like, you just have to go ask them for money <laughs> or you have to ask them <laughs> for time or you have to ask them um, to check out this, this case study. Or, you know, the, the, the next move doesn't always have to be contract signed or business, you know, um, like uh, meeting on the calendar. You know, oftentimes my call to action is something like, hey, um, I hope you'll give this some thought. And, and here's a couple other links to some of my other videos. I'll be following up next week. Shoot me a thumbs up if you want me to send you some times. But really, all I want you to do, Andrew, is just give this some thought and thank you for being in my network. You know, and you plant that seed in their mind. And now they're going to see my, my content come out next week and they're going, oh, well, you know what? This guy is kind of clever. And that was a thoughtful video. And then if I call them, it's not like, hey, can I give you my pitch? It's like, hey, Andrew, like, you know, I sent you that video last week. You got a sec to talk about it. And I've been in your head for a week now. You know, I've been a known quantity in your life. And that's so, it's so much easier to pitch when they're not just like rushing you off the phone, you know? But it's like, I find you have to be considerably more thoughtful on the front end. And, you know, the, the B2B B game was just spam people by the thousands constantly. And I tell them, I'm like, you are burning valuable leads. And when someone goes from a person who's being potentially open to you to just shutting the door and like rejecting you forcefully, you have to do so much work to get that relationship back to a place where they'll give you 30 seconds to tell you what you can do. You know, and I'm very careful with my leads now. I am, I do not, every single human relationship is valuable, whether or not they're going to pay me money. And I don't treat people like they're disposable. And that's the difference between me and B2B. And that's the difference in my content too. I don't make marketing content to appease millions of people. I don't have, you know, these Super Bowl ads I saw. It's just all ridiculousness, you know, because that that's all that works. I'm like, no, you, you talk to people, give them something real. Imagine you have one person listening to you say something that will resonate with them and it'll work, you know, and that's all I can do is just do it myself and show them there's a better way. You don't have to do business the way you did it two years ago. Yeah. And it probably won't work. You know, I'm sure you see all over LinkedIn, cold calling is dead or no cold calling's not dead. Well, it's all in how you do it. Right. And I've done my share of bad cold calls, but it's funny you mentioned the Super Bowl, the same thing. Those commercials are just using the 10 year old formula for a Super Bowl commercial and uh, just ratcheting up the ridiculousness and it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. No one cares. Uh, the, you know, the commercial that got the most attention was a QR code, you know? Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Cause what did they do? They broke the rules. Exactly. They showed up and they're like, you know what? We're going to have the weirdest ad. It's going to be low budget. Who do you even uses QR codes anymore? That's mysterious. It's just bouncing around. Maybe you want some of that. Um, you know, they created curiosity and um, that's what I tell people. And when people tell me, cause I, I get into arguments all the time cause I'm a Vidyard partner so I recommend that my clients use Vidyard and um, people will tell me they're like, oh, Vidyard works, but not for cold outreach. I'm like, are you insane? This is the <laughs> greatest attention grabbing, you know, medium you could possibly have. And so then I'll ask them some uncomfortable questions. I'll be like, was your video good? Scale of one to 10, how quality would you say it is? Okay. Did you surprise them? Did you have any surprises? I like to throw a surprise in the first three seconds of the video. And again, that can be really simple. That can be me 
you know, holding an object or something. Uh, I mean, be like, oh, I'm writing a pen or, you know, I could do just something that's interesting. But I'm like, okay, um, do you have any captions? No, okay, didn't have any captions. So it's like, and then I'll, I'll be like, why didn't you caption it? And they'll be like, well, there's no time. And I'm like, oh, captions are actually great. They're great for SEO. They help deaf people. They help mobile users. Most people are on mobile. We're sound off. And they're like, oh, no, I understand. Captions are great. I watch captions on Netflix. They're great for movies and marketing materials and video games and literally everything. But if I'm going to send a video to a CEO, I just don't put in captions. And I'm like, okay, well, um, that's a really important lead, right? <laughs> and, and if you close that lead, you're going to get 50% of the way to, to quota. So like, yeah, take 10 minutes to caption it and see what happens. You know, you already spent three hours making the video, you know, spend 10 minutes adding the captions. Um, and yeah, I just, I feel like video just has all this potential and people are just afraid to experiment. And what they're doing is they're just turning on the camera and filming themselves doing a cold pitch. I'm like, this is a medium. I do not even understand this medium yet, gang. And I think I'm doing it at a higher level than most. Um, I am learning new things all the time. And half the things I'm learning, I'm learning from filmmakers and influencers and, you know, YouTube people. And um, it's like, you really got to open to experiment. And I'll, I'll talk to sales leaders. You know, they've been studying the craft for decades. They've written books on how to cold call. They've done, you know, hundreds of thousands of cold pitches and then they make two videos that don't work and they're like all right well video doesn't work and it's like come on man you got to try a little bit harder than that you know and it's they don't want to look stupid is the problem people don't want to fail they don't want to look stupid so i'm like look at me i'm doing hamburg burglar bits out here guys i'm wearing the stupid stripy prison costume and i'm stealing hot dogs and i have a character called the hot dog burglar and that just got me a bunch of inbound leads you know because like Sea level people want to laugh too. And like, if you're a CEO of a company, he's going to be like, eh, I remember the Hamburglar. <laughs> like, it's <this is> pretty <laughs> funny, you know? And it's like, they don't, you don't stop laughing just because you've reached a certain amount of uh, wealth. You know, you still want to sure. laugh. And yeah, you... um, yeah p- people just didn't learn how to be funny. I'm like, all right, well, I, I spent way too much time <laughs> learning how to be funny. So I can share the knowledge. Well, you said people don't want to look stupid and yeah, no one does, but dare to suck, right? goes back to your, uh, back to your motto there. And if you suck, they just scroll past, you know, everybody thinks like, oh, what if I get, what if I lose my job? What if it's so unprofessional? I'm like, do you know how many bits I do that fail? Nobody remembers them because they just keep, if they get bored, they just keep scrolling. So I don't look at it like, oh, this massive, everyone's going to see that this video only got three likes. I'm such a failure. I go, okay, well, that didn't work. So let me try to figure out how I can make that better. Uh, That was a great idea that one of my famous friends told me is like, if you have a piece of content that fails, just try it again. Make it slightly better. You know, maybe a celebrity died 20 minutes after you posted that and all the people that would have watched it you know, read that instead. And the algorithm was just like, oh, this must not be a quality video. Um, But it's like, yeah, if your post fails, just try it again, slightly different. And sometimes it's a huge hit, you know, but um, you got to try, you got to try and you got to fail. Yeah. And I mean, the the funny thing there is that the failure is, oh, it sucks. Well, you know what else sucks? Every other piece of B2B marketing content, like how many gradient colors with text and buzzwords can we possibly look at, you know? So the worst case scenario is you're still better than that. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's an easy bar to hit. So we've been talking a lot at the high level about this stuff. Um, you know, I want to get some, some tactical, tangible advice for the folks listening. And what I want to do to kick that off was something that really struck a chord with me and made a lot of sense. When we connected, you told me about how using characters can be a powerful tool, uh, to tell a story, uh, and kind of, you know, manipulate how, uh, you, you, the person you're talking to or trying to communicate with is perceiving the conversation. So could you dive into characters and, and take it from there about some tactical things folks could do, you know, to dive into this? Yeah. So for characters, so one, the easiest tip I can give my audience is if you want to look good on video, use your phone, not your webcam. Especially if you're on a Mac, people think like, oh, I've got this brand new Mac. Um, The video quality is probably awesome. It is not. It is not. (laughs) Um, Your phone has an amazing camera. 
And this is a newer iPhone. I, when I first started doing videos, people would come to me and they're like, your footage looks beautiful. What kind of camera are you shooting that on? I'm like, it is an iPhone 8. If you are in a well-lit room, your phone takes amazing quality video. So use your phone and do not look at the screen. This is incredibly important. You do not look at the screen situated on a tripod and you look at the back of your phone. It is very important that you are not looking at your own appearance because what happens is when you're looking at the screen, your eyes are making all these little micro movements, right? And it comes off as nervousness and um, it looks like you're unfocused. So actually, if you see all my videos, I have perfect eye contact. I never break eye contact with the camera and it's because I'm looking at the back and that allows me to focus on the performance and not on my appearance. I'm not worried about, oh, my chin looks weird. Oh, I look overweight. I look, you know, that is just, that is not what's on my mind because I can't see how I look. And that, that is so important before you even start filming. Um, the other thing I'll say is before you start filming, go practice in front of a mirror. That allows me to understand what kind of energy I should bring. Because if you're looking in a mirror and you're right up in front of the mirror, that's how your audience is going to perceive you. So you can ask yourself, okay, how do I want to look when I show up on their computer, Right. Now, um, the big thing right now on TikTok is characters, right? People are doing these videos where it's them and they're playing multiple characters. And that is super easy to do because all you have to do is change costume. Um, especially if you want to throw on a pair of glasses or, you know, funny wig or hat or something. Um, but what a lot of people do is they play a caricature. Like an example is like people be like, I hate when marketing teams do this. So I'm going to play a marketing guy who's really stupid and obnoxious and my vi my video is going to be about making fun of him. Whereas um, what I say to do and what I learned at the Second City is you lean into a different part of yourself, right? So if I'm going to make fun of marketing, I'm actually going to cast myself as the marketer and I'm going to be just way too over enthusiastic and I'm going to speak in buzzwords and I'm looking at the camera the whole time and the joke is like clearly I'm coming on too strong and you know you're the audience member who's sitting there being like oh yeah I've definitely met this type of person before you know but it's still me and and I'm just playing a more excited version of myself um I play I've got a bunch of characters I play um one of them is the boss so he's me uh, in a suit. I've got a shirt and tie and a suit jacket on. Um, and he's like an amalgamation of like every sales boss I ever had. So when I pop into him, yeah, I'm real crouchy. And, uh, you know, he's kind of he's kind of almost like, you know, he's, he's got he's like kind of a, he yells a lot of cop cliches. You know, so <laughs> I just steal cop cliches from movies. So I'll be like, Bogue, my office now. Uh, you're a loose cannon, Bogue. You know, around here we follow the chain of command. And, um, you know, he's, I'm playing a version of myself. I'm, I'm, you know, changing my voice a little bit. I'm an angrier version of myself. I'm impatient. Um, I'm always like Hector in my regular character to like make the sales and go out there and close the deals. Um, but it's still just me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm playing a more impatient version of myself. Um, but I'm not playing a stupid version of myself. And that's very important. And um, I have a character named Snurg. Snurg is my best friend uh, who never talks to me. <laughs> and when it comes to me and Snurg, it's me and I've got a hat on and I got a book and I'm kind of being evasive, you know, and it's me over there, a salesperson, me being like, hey, Snurg, I bought you a present. And Snurg being like, oh, thanks, you know, and I'm just playing a version of myself that is disinterested and annoyed. Um, but I'm playing it real. And, you know, again, I don't have to come up with a crazy character. This is just me holding on to that energy. And that was the thing I learned in stand up, where it's like, if you deliver a punchline, like, let's say I'm doing a bit and I'm, I'm just surprised, you know, like that's the, the punchline. I'm surprised. And the audience goes nuts. I hang on to that surprise. I, I linger in there for a couple seconds. I stay in that moment and I let the audience laugh for a second. You know, I, I let that breathe and I tell them it's like it is not so much about the words. It is the energy you are putting out there. The audience is laughing because they, they're seeing me. I'm calm and relaxed. Then it cuts to me a much angrier, more intense version of me. Then it cuts to a more kind of like disinterested, like, oh, what's going on here? And all I'm doing is I'm just playing me with a different emotion. And um, I'll say to anybody who wants to get doing with it. It's like a simple costume change, a simple change in emotion. And when in doubt, steal from pop culture. You'll notice the people who do really successful stuff, uh, Vidyard, um, HubSpot, you know, they've got content teams that their content performs really well. 
And oftentimes, yeah, that's what they'll do. Chris Van Prague, um, he's a Vidyard guy. He makes a lot of really entertaining videos. And, you know, he'll just take a famous movie scene and he'll just cut out one of the people in there. Um, Todd Clauser at Refine Labs, I just had him on my show recently. He does a lot of this too, where you just take a beloved movie scene and you cut out one of the characters and it's you. You know, it's you're selling whatever. And um, that's really funny. And, and, you know, I tell people like, yes, be a storyteller. The stories that interest your audience are actually the stories they already know. They don't necessarily want to hear about your grandmother's pasta recipe, although that might be a touching story. Um, but actually, yeah, they love the movie Rocky. And if you go out there and do a Rocky parody, but it's you and you're punching and you're running up the stairs and, um, you know, you're punching the meat and, uh, you know, you're running and someone tosses you the apple. Like those are so iconic and you get 10 seconds of you doing the bit from Rocky and it's a sensation. You know, I did a Rocky bit and it was actually, it was, I got a couple clients off. It was nice. But, um, yeah, that's what I tell people is like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel when in doubt, steal from cartoons. And just remember, you're just playing a different version of you, you know? Those are great tips. And it's funny you mentioned the stealing movie stuff because we see the exact same thing with games. You know, if you bring a game to the office, it's way better to bring a game people are familiar with and then tweak it, right? So it's like you're riding the coattails of whatever nostalgic relationship they have with that game and they're also expecting you to change it. So you're like violating their expectations in, again in a good way. And I'm sure the same thing's happening with the movie. No one expects you to give a Stallone Rocky performance, but that's why they're tuning in to compare their memory with you, right? Or something like that. I don't know, well, yeah, something well, really interesting happened there. That one was actually a surprise. There. So I did that one because I, I beat the Vidyard world record. I wanted to see how many Vidyards I could send in one day. So I sent 104 Vidyards with captions in one day just to show people, hey, I don't recommend sending out 100 videos, but if you wanted to, you have time to do it, and you have time to do it with captions. Um, and the Rocky parody just comes in out of nowhere. It starts, I'm like, this video is brought to you by Vidyard. And then all of a sudden, I'm on character. So then the audience is seeing two versions of me, because I use a little wizardry with the editing. So all of a sudden, it's me talking to me. Both of us are in the shot, and it's the boss being like, Bogue, my office now. Um, and we're having an argument. You know, I need to make more dials. I say, why don't I make some Vidyards instead? Um, and he goes, 50 dials, and I go, and I go I go, how about, how about 50 vidyards? He goes, all right, a hundred vidyards, a hundred smiles, or it's your badge. Right. And it cuts to me sitting there. And all of a sudden you hear, bah, 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 bah. And it's like, I got a guy playing trombone. So it's like, you hear the trombone. It cuts to me. I'm wearing the hoodie. I'm running. They toss me an apple. I got my dog with me. It's me and my dog running up the stairs. And then it cuts to me in my kitchen and I'm reading a, like Atomic Habits and you see the guy with the trombone and he's playing it. And I'm like ducking under the slide. Um, but it, <laughs> it hits you out of nowhere. But it's like, as soon as you hear, bah, 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 it's like, oh, we're getting a Rocky montage. He's doing Rocky, you know, and I'll do that. And I'll, I did the Wolf of Wall Street. I did um, a Christmas Carol. Um, I love just throwing random pop culture in because the audience gets that. That's just a structure. And that was something South Park always did very well was like they understood structure and they understood, OK, we're going to make a movie. It is just Les Miserables, you know, but that's our structure to play with. And what Cartman's going to do is Cartman jokes and you, you, know, you can play with that. And they were so good at like. We are going to do this like a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, and we are going to adhere to all the conventions of the musical. And the plot is going to follow the same exact arc, but it's like this really stupid joke about Stan's dad, you know, <laughs> and um, Community did it really well. Rick and Morty does it really well. And I'm trying to show people like, hey, you go parody pop culture for 10 seconds. It kills it on TikTok. That's now your sales content. Right. Um, now you can show them, look at this cool thing that we did on TikTok. That's about the same thing that you are. You know, it's it's relevant to your world. Thought you might enjoy it. And you throw that little delight out there. And anybody who's like, dude, this is really funny. Now you're talking, you know, now you're actually having a real conversation. And um, I make it look easy. Again, I I did a lot of shows, and a lot of training to get to this level. But I know every company out there has a million performers. They got actors and musicians and dancers. They got people with more improv and sketch training than I have. Um, these people have the skills. They invested the time. They invested the money into developing these talents. What they need is permission to use them. 
permission to use them. And that's what this podcast is all about. Permission for our teams, our cultures, but also ourselves to get out there and do something human and interesting so we can, you know, make work as much fun as it is profitable, I guess, um, in, in our world. But Chris, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's clear you have cracked the code with interesting, uh, short content that gets attention and gets interaction and conversation started. Um, now is the time I would like to see if you are as good as at clicking your mouse and flapping your bird with uh, tap to flap. I'm going to drop a link here. You got a little practice time on this too. Um, but if you can share your screen and pull up that link, we're going to give you one minute to play and uh, see what kind of high score you can rack up in a minute. The game will automatically take your highest score. So if you crash and burn, just keep playing and uh, we'll take your highest score at the end of the minute. If you're still flapping at the end of the minute, I'm going to let you go and see how high you can go. Whenever you're ready, I will start the timer. Just give it a click. All right, we're off to the races. And it looks like the practice is paying off for you. Already oh, no, seven. Okay, okay. seven. Let's That's see. a good first run. You seem like a natural, Chris. Are you a gamer? I'm good at Smash Brothers. Oh no, but not good at. Yeah. Okay. That's eleven. You got I'm, about thirty yeah. seconds. I play Smash Brothers and Mario Kart pretty much. All right. Got about thirty seconds to top that eleven. Oh no! Alright, come on. Oh no! Okay, that's not good. Okay. I got it. Okay, here we go. Ah! That's alright, you got 10 seconds. One more run okay. here. Uh. Alright, that does it for your minute, but guess what? Oh no! Alright, alright, alright. Guess what? You are the winner. You have 11. You're at the top of the leaderboard for our guest. Seriously? Tap to flap leaderboard. You are. Oh, man. I got 16 earlier when I was like playing around on my phone. Well, you got 11 uh, and you're in first place. We'll see if you, how long you can keep it. We're going to keep letting the new guests practice like everything that we do. This is uh, this show is an iteration. And so we're trying to give uh, the guests a fair chance and we'll, we're, we're going to wrangle in the rules for season two. So we'll come back and make sure everyone's on an even playing field. But for now, you, sir, are in first place. Love it. I'm the king. <laughs> the You're king the of kings. Tap to flap. The king of tap to flap. So Chris, thank you so much for coming on and sharing, uh, sharing all your thoughts and, and expertise uh, in this area today. If anyone wants to get in touch with you or work with you uh, for marketing, but more importantly, uh, sales teams seems to be your niche for, for training, good, uh, good video usage and prospecting. How can people get in touch with you? Where's the best place to reach out? That's a great question. So you can find me at ChristopherBogue.com. Uh, all my coaching prices and packages are listed there. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just look for Chris Bogue. I am a creator there, so I post content every day. You can click my bell and follow me if you want cool updates every day. And you can also find me on TikTok at Chris Sells His Soul, or you can find me on Twitter at Chris Sells Soul. Awesome. And we'll include all those links uh, when we publish the, the episode. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. Andrew, thanks for having me. All right. Well, as also as always, this is brought to you by Incentive Pilot, where we gamify engagement for enterprise and channel marketing and enablement teams. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. 